Daily here in Washington, we're a telecom trade publication. Um, I'm gonna introduce our speakers and then do a little intro and ask some questions and think about questions you might have or we'll open it up near the end for questions and the, the person with the best question gets either a small cell or um, Julie's gonna give them <laughs> 10, uh, 10 megahertz of spectrum in the... Uh, kilohertz, I said kilohertz. Kilohertz, <laughs> well, it's really kilohertz. being very cheap for those of you who know what we're talking about. Um, today we're gonna have uh, Julie Knapp, he's chief of the Office of Engineering Technology at the FCC. We're gonna have Crystal Tully, she's policy director and counsel for the communications and technology uh, issues at the Senate Commerce Committee. Um, we have Peter Savvy, he's president of Savvy uh, Research, and we also have Karen Charles Peterson, she's commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Telecommunications and Cable. Um, and we're gonna talk about 5G issues, which are hot issues, and, and folks have talked about that at other sessions here today. Um, uh, it's coming faster than folks had thought it would be. Uh, in fact, AT&T plans to launch mobile services in a dozen markets later this year, and Verizon uh, plans to deploy residential 5G services in three to five markets uh, by the end of this year. Uh, while the 3G PP standards body has been busy working on standards for 5G, and the industry has been trialing technology, uh, policymakers in Washington have taken steps to do what they can. And the FCC commissioners, uh, led by Julie, uh, have repeatedly expressed their commitment to both make the necessary spectrum available for advanced services, and then also streamline deployment of wireless infrastructure. Congress has been active on 5G issues, including looking for more spectrum. Last August, the Senate passed the Mobile Now Act. Uh, in addition to making spectrum available, it also looks at some siting issues. Another bill, the Airwaves Act, was introduced uh, in the House last August, excuse me, in the Senate, and that would free up licensed and unlicensed spectrum. And the House tomorrow, the House uh, Communications Subcommittee, is gonna uh, have a hearing on a slew of telecom bills and resolutions, including those that are designed to streamline the deployment of infrastructure in states and localities. Uh, and in breaking news, um, Axios uh, reported last night on the release of a PowerPoint presentation and a memo that was reportedly written by a National Security Council aide that proposes the US government build a nationwide 5G network in the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band. Um, the documents argue that this will ensure a secure network can be built uh, and that the US can lead the world in the Internet of Things. It says that China is poised to lead in 5G deployment. The FCC commissioners and others dispute that in their statements today. Um, and they say that the, the private sector seems like it's gonna be doing just fine. And the industry agreed today with that. Uh, so we'll start with some questions and we're gonna open it up to you all soon. Um, First, I want to see if any of the panelists want to comment on the Trump administration's proposal. Um, we don't know that it's, it's endorsed by the whole administration or President Trump, but uh, this memo and PowerPoint uh, from the National Security Council. Um, as I said, it's been panned by commissioners, members of Congress, industry players, and public interest advocates as well. Um, would this be realistic, and would it harm the current private investment? And, and realizing some folks may or may not want to answer, but I want to give folks a chance, and we'll start with Julie if he wants to answer and move down the line. How did I know I'd be first? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the, the chairman and the commissioners have all weighed in and uh, in, in suggested that this would not be a good idea. I think one thing I would say, being from the technical office, that uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer to talk about 5G as a separate network <laughs> because 5G basically will be integrated with all of the existing networks. So this would not be, from a technical standpoint, something you could build as a separate network and still have it be uh, viable. All of the networks are interconnected both domestically and internationally. So uh, just from a technical standpoint, uh, I don't know that it makes a lot of sense. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it, I'd agree with that. Um, we've been a leader in 4G. There's been a lot of industry investment. Um, over the years, it, it's moving in the right direction. I think it'd be extremely costly um, to have a government built and run uh, 5G network. So I would agree with most of what's been said already today. Okay, Peter. Yeah, I would begin by echoing what Julie just said, which is that the operators um, all have their 4G networks built today on LTE technology, and the way 5G will be deployed is that it will, in many cases, be a, um, a layer for capacity that will integrate with the underlying 4G networks. Um, and there really are multiple 4G networks in that respect. So 
um, having a single 5G network that somehow integrates with all the existing um, networks doesn't make any sense. And then the other item is that 5G is really an extremely flexible toolkit of capability um, that will run across a vast array of um, spectrum, and there will be multiple 5G types of networks. There is not a single type of 5G network. You can do 5G at 600 megahertz, such as T-Mobile is going to do, and um, that will let you get coverage across the country very quickly. In contrast, Verizon is going to be emphasizing small cells and a very high capacity, high performance network. Um, so there's just multiple approaches to 5G. So trying to just arbitrarily pick one approach doesn't make any sense either. Okay. Did you want to comment? So, Paul, I'm going to take a completely different approach to this and okay. say I'm so sorry that I can't answer that because okay. I have not gotten prior approval from my administration back in Massachusetts. Okay. All right. That works. And would not want to speak before the governor did. <laughs> okay. That's probably a good idea. Um, let, let's open it up to some other questions. Crystal, can you give us a sense of what your boss, Senator Thune, hopes or expects regarding legislation? I, I mean, as I said, there's been action, but but there haven't been final bills recently passed, kind of comprehensive final bills passed. What, what would he hope or, or, or expect to see? Sure. Um, I think our first priority, is, uh, Senator Thune's first priority, is getting Mobile Now passed, um, for sure. We just spoke about the details of what's in that bill. It sits in the House right now, and I know the House is looking um, at spectrum priorities, also looking at um, a bunch of infrastructure bills. They'll hold a, a legislative hearing on tomorrow. We hope, um, and I know parts of, of Mobile Now are being considered as piecemeal bills uh, over there. Uh, before the committee tomorrow. So we hope to see uh, Mobile Now passed by the House since I need a law. It was a bipartisan bill that passed out of the Senate, um, and that's, I believe, a good start. Um, Senator Thune's also looking at a 5G deployment bill. He's got a staff discussion draft out there right now um, that would look at ways to streamline um, the deployment of 5G. So we're working right now at a staff level with industry stakeholders, uh, wireless carriers, cable, um, state and local governments, uh, poll, uh, the folks that own the polls, to try to figure out um, if we can come to some consensus and a way forward. And we hope to, uh, we're working with Senator Schatz uh, on that draft as well. So we hope to see a bill introduced in the next uh, few weeks and marked up soon after that. Okay, great. Did any did anyone want to comment on that or, no, okay. Um, uh, I wanted to ask Julie something. So the FCC has been active, as I said, on a number of fronts concerning 5G, both in trying to make more spectrum available in all the bands, uh, low band, mid band, high band. Um, and the mid band was what uh, was subject of that memo uh, in the National Security Council, um, as well as um, looking for ways to streamline deployment. Can you give us a sense, kind of an overview for those who might not be familiar generally of what you've done and what you're hoping to do in and how those two work together, that is spectrum as well as infrastructure, realizing the latter is something that OET doesn't deal with specifically, but but is part of the whole pie. Yeah, so, uh, and not to get too techy with all the details, but we've been active trying to make spectrum available, Paul mentioned low, mid, high, why? The low spectrum is great for coverage and penetration, so if, if, if you wanna make sure your signal's getting everywhere, the low band spectrum is essential. The mid band is a great mix between capacity and coverage. And then the upper reaches, we've been looking at it, it's spectrum that people never thought would be useful for mobile. Uh, so I have committed to never say what is the upper bound for mobile spectrum. <laughs> you could tell us and we just won't tell anyone. I, I wrote a letter 25, 30 years ago saying the high, this is after the first generation of cellular, anything above one gigahertz, <laughs> you know, and then for the longest time we talked about three and then six gigahertz and here we are talking about millimeter wave bands way up there. So uh, across all of these fronts, we have been uh, endeavoring to make spectrum available. And I think every piece of it can, is going to play a role in 5G. <laughs> you know, whether it's introduced immediately or over time, all those pieces are, are critical. Uh, you're right, Paul, my office has not been uh, directly involved in the infrastructure stuff. That's more of a wireless bureau, but great to have the spectrum and all the framework in place, but then you've got to deploy networks. <laughs> and what you want to have happen is make sure that people are able to deploy networks weighing that against, you know, there are other stakeholder interests as, as well, but uh, 
you know, the, things are moving so fast today. If it takes a long time to get something approved, by the time you're ready to deploy, it's old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd like to just add to the spectrum item, which is, as Julie mentioned, we've been pushing upward in the spectrum that we can use, and we've gone, a, you know, 100 megahertz at a time and now a gigahertz at a time, but really 5G um, ch changes things considerably because it uses a technology called massive MIMO where you use large arrays of antennas to focus the radio signal and that allows practical use of the millimeter wave bands and therefore frequencies such as 28 and 37, et cetera, gigahertz are practical for the first time for these types of network networks, but what's interesting is that as you go higher in frequency, up towards 100 gigahertz, um, in the past, going up, say, from 28 to you know, 90, 70, 80, 90 gigahertz would have been fundamentally different. Those would have been much higher frequencies, but with massive MIMO, as you go up in frequency, the wavelengths get smaller, and you can have larger, denser arrays of antennas to compensate for some of the propagation losses you would normally have. And therefore, suddenly, we can talk about using both 28 gigahertz and 90 gigahertz, and both are within kind of achievable limits of the technology in the next, um, you know, over the next five to 10 years. So really, the game has changed in some fundamental ways with 5G. Thank you. Um, so on infrastructure, Karen, one of the hot issues, as we said, is infrastructure. And um, the FCC has talked about and asked questions on whether they should preempt states and localities, uh, whether there should be deemed granted, which would say basically if a, if a state or locality doesn't act on an application for infrastructure by a certain time, it would be deemed granted. These issues have been before the Broadband Deployment Advisory Committee of the FCC, which is still working and, in fact, had a two-day meeting last week. I wanted to get your views on, on um, the proposals before the FCC and, um, and what you think of those. Sure. Thank you for the question. So as a state regulator, I'm sure you can imagine that um, when you bring up terms like preemption and deemed granted, um, it sends a chill down my spine. <laughs> um, so those aren't terms that um, localities are thrilled about, um, but I do understand um, sort of the reasoning behind it. Um, I think that, you know, I am a member of the BDAC, so I was at that two-day meeting. I think there are ways that we can co come to a compromise, um, and that's really what I've been pushing on on the BDAC. Um, we don't want to necessarily take rights away from communities. Um, the communities understand that they need the infrastructure, they want the technology, um, and they want to work with industry. But we need to f figure out how we can do that collaboratively and, and, and create a partnership. Um, you know, there's been some uh, discussion that the uh, makeup of the BDAC is a little uh, lopsided. Um, I'm doing all I can as a state regulator to bring some um, equilibrium to the to the BDAC um, with my other state and municipal colleagues. Um, but you know, it's it's hard, right? So we are pushing for states and and communities, municipalities, for their rights to be preserved, but also ensuring that industry can deploy in a way that they need to to bring the technology because we want the technology and industry wants to bring it. You mentioned that some folks think that it's a little lopsided in the membership. One of the more prominent members actually quit last week, saying he, he that did. kind of the 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 deck is stacked, and he's a mayor from San Jose. Do you think, um, was that surprising, and would you think maybe others might do the same thing? So, uh, good question. You know, in some ways it was surprising, and in other ways it was not surprising. So at the two-day meeting, I got to see firsthand his frustration um, with some of the uh, policies that were coming out of the VDAC. Um, I have to say that there were many others in the room that were as equally as frustrated. Um, you know, I'm not one to throw in the towel, so I'm not saying that that's where I am in terms of the BDAC. I think that there's a lot of good work that has happened on the BDAC. There is a lot of good work to still come out of the BDAC, but I think uh, we all need to figure out how we can work more collaboratively. I, I understand where the mayor was coming from, um, and I think that he needed to do what was right for him um, and what's right for what was right for his city, um, and to send a message. You know, I will say this about um, why the mayor may have done what he did. I mean, at one point, um, his city was described as being 
um, low on the technology sort of curve. And he, he got a little frustrated with that, saying, you know, I'm from San Jose, you, you know, there's technology all around me and from my city. So um, I think that he felt that he was being disparaged a bit right. um, and wanted to send a strong message. Right. Peter, let, I want to drill down a little on the technology. Um, you research the technology, and a lot of your clients are industry folks. For those in the audience who might not be familiar with these details, can you explain why millions of cells, perhaps millions of cells, will be needed for 5G and why uh, going from 4 to 5G is not really just another G, if you will, like going from 3 to 4? I mean, the title of this, pre of this or one of the things in this, um, the description of this session is the Internet of Things and what that will bring. Can you just cover that a little for folks who might not do this every day? Sure. Well, there's a, a couple of items that you have to consider in the performance of a wireless network. And, and one is capacity, which is how many users can you support um, in what density doing what kinds of things. If you want a wireless network, and 5G will be able to do this, to compete directly against coax um, cable networks, then, and, and I issued a report on this last year where I actually went into um, you know, a fairly deep model. Um, you need a fairly dense number of sites um, to be able to provide that capacity. And depending on the capacity you need, it can be anywhere from 10 um, to 100 sites per square kilometer. That's a much denser network than what we have today. But that type of network um, solves two problems. One is that with these millimeter wave frequencies, um, that um, Julie's working hard to make available, um, we're going to have 10 times as much spectrum suddenly becoming available than we have in all of the existing cellular bands. Um, because in those higher regions of spectrum, there's just more spectrum available. But the propagation of those frequencies is very limited. So the maximum distance you can practice go with these millimeter wave frequencies is measured in hundreds of meters. You know, in best case conditions, maybe you can go 500 meters, but if there's foliage around, uh, maybe it's only 100 meters. Therefore, you need a lot of sites, and that will make for extremely dense networks. The great thing about that, though, is that for any site, you're not sharing that spectrum among that many people, and therefore, the capacity and capabilities um, of each of that type of network will directly be competitive with existing coax networks. Now, let me just mention that there's way more spectrum at light than there is in radio. So you can never replace fiber optic cable with radio, but you can certainly compete against a lot of existing um, wireline networks. Now, on the other hand, for Internet of Things, often what you want is broad coverage. And if you're trying to cover and put sensors into the environment and run it over roadways and, and, and everywhere, you're not going to solve that problem with small cells. Then you'll need to uh, use lower frequencies to get that ubiquitous coverage. So really, 5G will operate um, all the way from 600 megahertz, which is, you know, those are the lowest frequencies available for cellular right now, and then all the way into millimeter wave. And then depending on what your use case is, that will determine whether you're using a small cell architecture or using larger cells, you know, the existing macro sites, um, but at lower frequencies. Thank you very much. Um, wanted to come back to Karen for a second. One of the um, uh, one, one of the issues, and we mentioned preemption, uh, that they saw comments on that. Um, FCC commissioners, including Commissioner O'Reilly, have said that we're not suggesting that all, there's that all the communities are bad actors in terms of not acting in a reasonable time frame or with reasonable fees um, on applications, but that um, we just can't wait and. Uh, necessarily, and the bad actors maybe are giving everyone a bad name. So I wanted to ask you your view on that and, and your view on the relationship between the communities. Has it gotten worse, or is it the same or better with the FCC, particularly when these issues such as, as you said, what gives you a chill, um, preemption uh, and or uh, deemed granted? It's a good question. Thank you for that, Paul. So, you know, I wouldn't describe communities um, that uh, may be taking too long or to uh, 
approve applications or their fees may be may seem high to some as bad actors. Um, you know, we I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with why we're always painting communities with one brush because they're very diverse. They're very different. Um, so we have small communities, we have medium-sized communities, we have large communities. We have communities where, you know, the, the office that may be uh, processing these applications are open only four days a week. I mean, there, or maybe they have limited hours, right? So those are maybe some of the smaller communities. And we have some communities where they may charge one price for poll attachment and other communities may f uh, charge either a higher or a lower price for to meet their needs. Um, as we all know, communities, government um, across the country, um, the funds aren't there, right? Every, every government is looking for ways, creative ways to bring more dollars. Um, I don't think that industry should necessarily have the opportunity to dictate to a community what they should charge. I think it's up to the community. The community knows their community the best um, and what they need. Uh, also, I don't think industry, and I would love to work with industry on this, encourage industry to educate communities on the technology. So, you know, like, like Peter just said, um, these devices, these small cells, will be closer together, so that means more applications. You know, so if you have a community that has limited office hours, limited employees, but you're going to now bring them 300 applications at a time, what are they to do with that? They don't understand the technology. Um, they're overwhelmed. So how do we address those issues and not necessarily say that they're bad actors because they're, they can't go through the volume um, at the pace that providers would like them to, but how can we sort of address those issues and make sure that there's a, an even playing field? Is the danger of doing these model codes, is it um, treats them all the same? In other words, some of the model codes basically say, okay, this is what they should do as, as a best practice that the BDAC has looked at? Right, that's a big part of it. And one of the things that I pushed for the um, model code for states, which is the uh, working group that, I vice chair, that I'm the vice chair of, it's for there to be a preamble and to really stress that um, when legislators are looking at these documents um, to adopt, that... Um, they get to pick and choose what portions of the document would work best for, for, their, for their community, for their state. Okay, thank you. Let's see if any of the folks in the audience would like to ask questions. Do we have any questions? Yes. And can you uh, identify yourself first? It's a question for Peter. Um, a lot of times small cell and 5G are used interchangeably, and I'm not a spectrum guru by any means, but my understanding is they're not the same. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Small cells refers to cells that um, are small, and that would be defined <laughs> as maybe a you know less than less than say half a kilometer um, of propagation. Um, Com compared to what? For instance, for those who might not yeah. know, what, what what would a propagation be for a macro cell? Yeah, How a macro could be anywhere from a kilometer to ten or fifteen or even twenty kilometers. So if you're driving down a freeway and occasionally see a really large tower, that's definitely a macro. Um, as far as small cells, you may not even recognize a small cell. It might just be a little box on the side of a building or a small pole. It doesn't even look like a regular cellular um, tower. For instance, Julie, you might not know this, and you probably have a better reception in here. He's actually also a small cell. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right. Did Julie know I had to be the one to tell you sorry, Julie. Yeah. So, the, so, um, so you, you, you need small cells for the limited propagation of the millimeter wave frequencies. But as I mentioned before, the thing that's really unique about 5G relative to previous generations is that it's being d designed extremely flexibly. It's a very scalable architecture, so it can handle different frequencies. And some, and, and it will eventually, or depending on the operator, it'll also be used in existing cellular bands or 600 megahertz um, in the case of T-Mobile, in which case it will definitely not be on small cells. So Good. Why, if I just follow up, why do you think there's this conflation in the popular terminology? Well, probably because being able to harness these millimeter wave frequencies is the most dramatic new capability of 5G 
and that is where you get the multi-gigabit per second performance. That's where you get the ability to directly compete with um, cable networks. So that, that really stands out as being um, one of the most noticeable capabilities of 5G, and I think that's where the two get lumped together. Thank you. Uh, other questions from the audience? Well, Trish? So okay. And can you identify yourself? Yeah, Trisha Pilevit, Harris Western Greenness. Um, but I thought the small cell also did refer to the actual format of the base station. And I thought as you get up higher in, in millimeter wave, the, the base station can, or the, the station can actually be smaller because the millimeter wave signal is more condensed. Right. Well, that's true. Um, not only is the coverage area small, but the cell, the equipment itself becomes very small. Yeah. Thank Behind you. That's a good point. Yes. <laughs> And you're, who are you? Sorry, Gavin because? Logan, and I'm with the National Urban League. Um, two questions. One, my first question is, with the spread of 5G and, and, and other things, we often talk about it as being this ubiquitous service or this ubiquitous thing that will be available to everyone. Um, now, in full disclosure, I, in a previous life, I was a local franchise authority with regulator. And I do know that one of the reasons it was actually oftentimes, despite a lot of the private industry claims, you had to push the providers to get into an entire area, entire service. One of the things I'm concerned about is that, as you, you stated, uh, and it's been stated by the panel, 5G is not, doesn't have necessarily the service length. So particularly when you get into the larger metropolis cities where how can you uh, convince us all that this will actually be something available to everyone? Um, not just the city centers, but when you're getting into the, the outskirts of the city, the suburbs, and frankly, even the rural areas, because a lot of what you hear on the, the, the infrastructure side is, it's too expensive to get out here. It's too, too hard to build out in these areas. There are too many difficulties. And one of my concerns is that while as great as all of this new technology is going to be, we, we've been down this road before. So I, I guess I'll st stop at that question. Anyone? So I'll, I'll, yeah, go, go, Julie, go first. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give Peter a rest. <laughs> So, I mean, that, that's very much on our mind, to make sure that uh, we have a variety of ways that service can be deployed. So I'll just hit one example. In, in this one block of spectrum we've been calling the citizen broadband radio service, mm -hmm. uh, it's 150 megahertz. Um, there's some of it that will be licensed and some of it that will be available for everybody. <laughs> and then by location, Let's say of the seven, what we call PAL licenses aren't available, that's not being used, all of it could be available. So everybody has an opportunity to deploy. And I think the way the networks are going to be deployed, there'll be a mix. So you won't have one technology. I wouldn't try to cover everywhere at 60 gigahertz, <laughs> but there's spectrum there for unlicensed as well. And so what I think you're going to see is when we started talking about low, mid, high, <laughs> weaving together the pieces, lower bands to get the pipe out to the more rural area, and then some of these higher bands to distribute the service. But we, you know, we're making a lot of efforts to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to, to take the advantage of these new technologies. Well, and, and what I would quickly add is that operators are highly motivated to use the latest generation of technology because usually it's much more efficient than the previous generation. So they need less spectrum to deliver the same amount of capability. So that's one motivator. The other one is that running multiple technologies at the same time is expensive from an infrastructure and management point of view. So getting people onto the latest technology and, and off the more obsolete technologies is another motivator. Can I just add one more wrinkle to this? Um, so that was a, that's a really good question. Um, I think one of the issues that we're going to see, however, in communities that don't have 4G or they don't have fiber, how do they get 5G? Since 5G is not replacing 4G, it's just expanding the network. 
and you need fiber in order to have 5G. So these are all tricky questions. There, some of the concerns about digital red lines. Right. So these are all, all issues that I know the FCC and the BDAC are looking at. Um, and I know that industry is looking at it. They want to try to bring service to areas where there is none today. But again, like Peter said, it, it is expensive. Um, and it's a, it's a proposition that we all have to sort of put our heads together to figure out. Yeah. So just yes. to add real quickly, 5G does not replace fiber. Um, you still need a lot of fiber to feed all the cells. But one of the, one of the under-reported capabilities of 5G, because it's not going to be available until it's um, a subsequent release, is something called integrated access and backhaul. And that means being able to use 5G itself as the backhaul. And that means that maybe only one in four or even one in ten sites actually needs fiber. The rest can be fed from the wireless network itself. And that will allow the spread of um, coverage much faster than previous generations. Just to note, um, Julie mentioned the citizens' broadband radio service in the 3.5 gigahertz band. The FCC is looking at modifying the rules for the priority access licenses. There are folks called wireless internet service providers. They're WISPs. They're in many rural areas. They are a little concerned with the ways that are being proposed to modify those rules. But that spectrum, the idea is, could be used in addition to urban areas for rural areas. Do we have any other questions? OK, be thinking about questions. We'll come back to you. Um, well, yes. Me, I, there's one thing I wanted to uh, get across, because I think people miss this. Because um, in the abstract of uh, capacity, <laughs> and we talk about latency, and so what does all that mean to folks? Uh, so what we're seeing is an explosion <laughs> in new applications, the way things can, can operate. Uh, some of them, when we talk about IoT, only go blip <laughs> every now and then. They only need a few kilobits. Uh, on my way over here, I was, you know, one thing caught my eye, whether you call it IoT or not, at the bus stop in the shelter. Now is a sign that tells you when the bus is coming. <laughs> this is kind of another example of the way people are coming up with creative ways of using it. Some of the applications require lots of bandwidth. When we start talking about, I was at the Consumer Electronics Show, uh, and you put on the goggles for it's a game, virtual reality, and you, you know at first you, it, it, you think about well, you know, would you, how interested are you? But the the point of it is instead we've moved from what struck me, uh, I have a grown-up son who's still playing games, <laughs> <laughs> and they're pretty impressive, but they are in two dimensions. It's a flat screen. Now suddenly, if I'm going to interact wirelessly, there's a lot more information with the, the layering and the dimension. So the capacity is really needed for all of the, those things. Let's talk for a second about latency. <laughs> uh, it might not matter if my smart meter is updating two seconds later. <laughs> Doesn't make a difference. But what's changing is that now I can have real-time interactions with things. <laughs> uh, if I want to control a machine at a distance, I can't move the handle and then watch three seconds later when the machine moves. <laughs> Uh, so there are applications, whether it's vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle technology, that need this reduced latency. And that's the, one of the game changers about 5G. <laughs> uh, and, and whether which band it occurs in or how we label the networks, it's that capacity that opens up the door to all sorts of new applications that you really couldn't do before. So thanks for going on, but sure. I thought it might help people to understand. Sure. Uh, let me, uh, I had asked Karen a question about how folks are getting along. Let's talk about the Hill Crystal. So the Hill's not getting along right now on a number of issues, and we're not going to talk about net neutrality because then everyone will have to leave and I'll leave too. <laughs> However, people like to say, well, telecom bills are bipartisan, and that's somewhat true but not always true. Can you give us a sense for if you think that's more true? You mentioned the Mobile Now Act was bipartisan. Can you give us a sense for if you think, even though folks may not be working together on everything, if it's more likely they will get things through on the telecom area? Yeah, 
Yeah, I think so. Um, I'm hopeful for sure. And I think 5G is a good area where we can come together and agree that it's U U.S. maintaining leadership is a good thing. Um, I think we're definitely going to disagree on how to get there. But an example I mentioned before is um, Senator Thune working with Senator Schatz now on this draft um, deployment bill. And we hope to have, uh, similar to the House, uh, their approach with a lot of different members introducing um, pieces of, of a larger infrastructure package. We hope to see the same. We hope to have um, members on both sides of the aisle on our committee uh, have priorities and come to us and uh, hopefully um, pass some larger bill or at least certainly um, a slew of bills that uh, have a lot of different member priorities and that we can package it together in some kind of bipartisan way. So, yeah, there are a lot of issues that we disagree on for sure and definitely don't want to get into net neutrality if I can avoid it, of course. Um, but certainly I think 5G deployment is something that um, there's – uh, agreement on, at least in some areas. And you mentioned infrastructure. The, the Trump administration is expected to come out with their plan soon. And there have been folks have said, well, we'd be good to have some money in there for broadband. There have been some suggestions that there might be some policy, but not actual money. Is there anything you, you all have heard on Senate Commerce? Yeah, I think we've heard the same, that there isn't going to be a dedica dedicated streamline um, our program for, for broadband, for sure. But um, I think that the block grant program that has been floated um, by the White House, those funds can be used for broadband if the state chooses to do that. Um, and we don't know what the final package looks like. They haven't um, uh, given it to us yet. We hope to see that in the next few weeks. But certainly it's a big priority for Senator Thune to – ensure that broadband um, certainly as a policy piece is part of the overall package and starting with deployment. Karen, how much of that would you like? All. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've made it clear um, how much uh, Massachusetts would like to see of that, those dollars. And, and obviously dedicated would be better than just um, competing on a block grant with Absolutely. many other things that are not just broadband. Exactly. It does seem like when the folks talk about the infrastructure, they talk about the, the roads, the bridges, things that are crumbling like that, and then broadband's mentioned, but it's not the first thing because it's not really crumbling the same way these other things are crumbling. Yeah, so I think that the topic or the issue of broadband is slowly gaining momentum in terms of um, – uh, being considered as a critical infrastructure. Um, we're not quite there yet, although I would like us to be, but it's slowly getting there. I think um, uh, legislative bodies across the country and on the Hill, they're just beginning to see how uh, broadband infrastructure, broadband um, is, is as vital as these other infrastructures. Um, you know, one of the stories that I like to tell is that we have communities in Massachusetts that are literally dying on the vine. These are communities where um, there's no broadband. We actually have communities, I was telling someone this earlier and they didn't believe me. Um, we have communities or had communities, we're working on addressing it today, um, that had no cable. And as you know, that's one of the primary ways that residents receive broadband um, is through their cable provider. So if you have no cable in your town, <laughs> you have no broadband. Um, and, we, and so those communities have, have been dying for years, um, meaning that um, Kids, as they graduate from high school, they're not returning. Um, so those homes are not being sold. If a family is putting their house up for sale, they can't get their house sold. Um, it's just businesses, uh, of, uh, an individual, an entrepreneur um, can't start a business or is having a difficult time maintaining their business because they have no broadband service in that community. So um, I think, uh, and this is not only happening in Massachusetts, it's happening across the country. Um, so I think legislative bodies are seeing this, government's seeing this, um, and we're all working really, really hard to try to figure out how we can sort of enhance and build the infrastructure um, so we can bring life back to these communities. Do you, are people surprised by that when you speak at audiences? Because when people think of Massachusetts, they probably think of Boston or areas east of that, but they might not think of western Massachusetts and the, they might not be aware there are rural areas in Massachusetts. Yeah, so that's interesting. So if I have this conversation on the east coast, <laughs> folks are familiar with the Berkshires. <laughs> and that's really, you know, what I'm talking about, the western part of the state. Um, but definitely if I'm at a conference um, and there are individuals sometimes that are not familiar with the makeup of Massachusetts, they find that very hard. They think of Massachusetts, they think of Boston, they think of Harvard, they think of MIT. And when you think of, when you have that image, you're not thinking of communities that don't have access to broadband. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, and can you identify yourself? Yes, Lauren Smith, Speaker of Privacy Forum. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about uh, using spectrum for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. There's been a whole debate about whether 
5G or GSRC would work better. I'd love to hear your thoughts. So I think that's big. No, I can't. <laughs> 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 so the commission, quite a while back, had allocated spectrum for uh, intelligent transportation systems, and you know, there's another band, but every, all the focus has been on 5.9 gigahertz. Uh, and the Department of Transportation, working with the automotive industry, has done a lot of work. The allocation is still there. The service rules are still there. People can deploy today. <laughs> so the, the commission has not proposed to change those rules. Uh, what we have been studying is sharing uh, part of that spectrum with unlicensed and whether that will work. And we've been doing tests at our laboratory. Uh, stay tuned, more to come on that. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, as the new generations of wireless technologies have evolved, the industry, together with some in the automotive, are exploring. Uh, whether that technology uh, might meet at least some of the same needs. <laughs> and, and so I think that work is still going on, uh, and we'll see where it leads. Yeah, there's, from a standards point of view in LTE, there's been a tremendous amount of development on something called um, V2X, which is vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure communications. And that really points to one of the emerging use cases that, that Julie was talking about. Um, for 5G, which is real-time communications um, for mission-critical applications, um, whether it's drone control, so your drone doesn't crash into a building, or, um, or to be able to alert a car that, um, because of your sensor network that there's a pedestrian um, around the corner. And that will require the very low latency that Julie also mentioned. 5G is being developed for a one millisecond. That's one thousandth of a second. Um, latency, and even though we're not going to talk about network neutrality, 5G will I'm very sorry, have to leave. <laughs> will very heavily depend on prioritization, which is that if you're going to communicate, um, you know, just a small number of bits to a car that there is a pedestrian in the roadway, those bits should not have to compete with somebody's YouTube stream. We're going to wrap up in a second, Julie, on the 5.9. We're waiting for, I believe, is it one or two reports on that first round of testing, and can you give us a sense of when that might be released? One or two reports. <laughs> I think it would be one combined report, Okay. Uh, and we're working on it right now. It, can you tell me, and then I won't tell anyone else? <laughs> I, <laughs> there's nobody else listening, are there? <laughs> um, one more question, anyone? Before we wrap up, okay. Does anyone, we're, we have a hard stop. Is there anything I haven't asked that you want to add uh, before we wrap here, up here on, on any of the issues we've discussed or anything else? No? Okay. Yes, Trish. So, uh, Crystal, certainly the FCC and the VDAC have been kicking around preemption, and there's an argument that whether the FCC has that authority. Has that discussion been up on the Hill? I haven't heard Senator Thune say anything on that. But. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, I mean, we're looking at our own bill, and we're certainly looking, um, keeping track of what the FCC is doing and what the BDAC is doing. It's informing some of our own work on our own deployment bill. Thank you. Please help me thank our panelists. Nice to <laughs> we have everyone, we have a coffee break now until four, and then downstairs we're going to have Jessica Rosenworth so the FCC is going to give us a keynote speech. Great. Thank you. <laughs> for the deployment bill? Uh, for the deployment bill? Uh,